What's up guys, Ryan Schultz here from E39 Source in Escondido, California. This is my 2002 BMW E39 540 and today we're going to be doing a heated seat retrofit for the front. Acquired this car several months ago now and that's one feature that I do miss. We have cool winters here in California, cool mornings, cool evenings throughout the winter months and having heated seats, even if not for the heat, uh, just kind of nice on the back after a long day. So. Uh, the retrofit begins here. This shouldn't be crazy, crazy long. I have done this once before on a E39 530 a few years ago. And we're actually going to be changing these seats as well. I have really come to dislike the standard E39 comfort seats, as they're called. This is a sport package car that was optioned with the comfort seats, which gave you the base bottom seat with no bolsters, no support whatsoever. And the trick here is this little switch that folds the center of the seat kind of below your shoulder blades, which in my opinion adds no value or comfort. To retrofit the heated seats, you do not have to change the seats. You can attempt to find the heating panels and install them underneath the leather but on top of the cushions. Uh, I think some of those are still available, perhaps aftermarket. That's what my client a few years ago did. Um, in my case, I wanted to change the seats anyhow, so I have found a set of uh, actually E38 7 Series seats that are compatible with the E39. They use the same connectors, at least for the later model E38s, and the same tracks that'll bolt right in. So this video will detail how to remove the seats, how to retrofit the wiring, and how to reinstall the seats. We're not going to be tearing the seats down to replace anything underneath since I'm not doing that. Talk briefly about a few components that we need to change. Um, obviously the seat, if you'd rather just buy a used seat and put that in versus adding just the heating panels underneath the leather. Then we'll need a center console switch panel, the SCM, which is down here. We'll need one of these that retains the buttons you already have and adds the heated seat buttons. These are not really available new. You can buy something that has a million buttons in it at several hundred dollars doesn't really make sense. What I recommend doing is heading over to eBay, search for E39 center console switch, and go through the photos until you find what you need. We also need a retrofit wiring harness, which is no longer available. Thankfully, there are crazy people like me out in Germany that are uh, remanufacturing these and using the same types of wire, the same colors, the same pins. It will largely be a plug and play wiring harness. We're gonna be plugging in maybe four or five pins on the back side of here and running those wires behind the console, underneath the console trim, uh, underneath a little bit of carpeting, and then under the seat. I'm gonna start here this afternoon with removing the existing front seats. And there's four bolts, one wiring harness, and a tricky little spring clip thing uh, that hold these seats in. So we'll start off by rolling the seat all the way back, and that will expose two Torx 50 fasteners, one here and one up there. Let's start with removing those. A quick note about moving the seat back, if your seat does not go back far enough to allow you to access those front Torx 50 bolts, there's actually a bit of a, a stopper on, I think it's the inside of these seat rails that prohibit the seat from going back too far. And if you take a look at that, it, it like sits in this chain here or something like that, you, you'll see it and you can just pull that straight up and that will enable the seat to go all the way back. I have no idea why BMW put that there. Note that the bolts have blue Loctite on there, so as we reinstall the seats later in this video, we'll be adding a little bit more blue Loctite. Um, BMW requests that you replace these bolts purely because they are coated in Loctite. Uh, you can just add your own Loctite. They're not torque to yield bolts. With the front two out, we're gonna go ahead and move the seat all the way forwards and do the rear two. With the seat all of the way forwards, we have two small black plastic trims that need to be removed from the seat rails here and they're real fragile at these corners. So I usually use um, some sort of a screwdriver or a metal pry tool get in here and there's two little clips. Just pry those up and then this piece will come right off. It just clips on with some plastic. That will expose the T50 bolts that hold the rear of the seat in. After that, we're gonna raise the seat all the way up, not the front part of the seat, but the entire bottom cushion. And that's going to expose this little clip that is quite tricky until you understand how it works. Get some light, we'll get a better look at it. I'm going to do my best to get this on camera, but it's this clip right here that we need to release that attaches to a steel cable. The idea is when you move the seat forwards and backwards, and if you're a taller individual, you likely sit further back, that actually raises the height of the seat belt in the B pillar. So with the seat all the way forwards, this is down low. If I were to bring the seat back, this would slowly pull its way up so it hits your taller chest better. It's a brilliant idea, kind of a quirky design. So the pin in the center here rotates and locks 
as it hinges down on top of the rest of the clip. You should be able to take a small screwdriver and insert it into the circular opening here and give it a turn like that and see how that whole thing hinged up. Now we can take the clip and continue to rotate it. Might need a pick tool. Nope. Continue to rotate it all the way out like this and then it will slide out towards the center console towards the middle of the car and free itself from the seat. Well, we're down here. We've got one more Torx 50 to remove and that's going to be for the seat belt. It's on the outside close to the B pillar right here. So let's take out that T50, at which point we'll be able to grab the seat belt and pull it up through the seat trim and have it fully detached from the seat. The only thing holding the seat in the car right now is the electrical harness, which is in the front underneath the seat. And it's behind this black little trap door cover that hinges open. To remove the connector, we need a flathead screwdriver and we insert that right here at this end, pry to the side. You'll notice that unlocks the entire connector and pushes it out. Now, with the seat disconnected, if you cycle the key, you will get an airbag light because your seatbelt pretensioners are missing. The airbag module does not like that. Uh, we also want to make some adjustments to the seat before we fully disconnect it and remove it from the car, uh, just to make it easier to get in and out of the car. So we'll keep that plugged in at the moment. If you're changing seats, you may want to retain some of your buttons, switches, or perhaps your entire piece of trim if it's in fairly good condition like this one. In order to do that, there's a few screws and a few clips that hold this onto the seat. And one of them is right here behind the leather. That's a Torx 30. And the only way to access that is to recline the seat back, then pull the bottom rest leather forwards and remove that screw. To make the seats easy to remove from the car, we can remove the headrests. The way to do that is pretty much put it in a position like this, shove your arm in there and just leverage it out. I just released it. It takes a pretty good bit of force, but once you get that loose enough, we'll just be able to tilt the seat back so we don't hit the headliner and take the whole headrest out. Another quick note, you may want to salvage your front seat rail covers as well. Just look like this. It's just like the rear. Squeeze those tabs. Be real careful up here by my pinky where they hinge. That's the weak part of the plastic. I don't know if my new seats have this and these are pretty decent. I can clean those up. So uh, those are off. Now we put the seat in a position where it is most easy to remove from the car. In my opinion, that is the bottom cushion all the way down. Then we bring the seat up right there where this plastic piece lines up with the front of the track. We tilt the backrest all the way forwards and we take the headrests out. At this point, we're ready to muscle the seat out of the car. These things are quite heavy. I've put down just some towels over here, over the threshold and sill plate here so we don't scratch anything. So we've just got to be careful here along the B-pillar and door panel. But they'll lift straight up and come out in this position. I kind of hinge the bottom cushion out first and then the top. But with the headrests out, it shouldn't be too bad. A little heavy, a little awkward. It's best to have somebody hold the door all the way open so you get that much more room. We've gotten the seats out of the car. This side has been cleaned. Now is an excellent time to do so. That side I'll get to shortly. I'm going to be adding a few pins into this connector right here. Uh, so we'll be talking about taking that apart and feeding the rest of the wiring up through this hole in the carpeting. Thankfully, the carpeting in this car is split, and it's split right here at a great place. So we'll be able to peel that back and run our wiring from our switch down. Speaking of wiring, we're going to go ahead and start that, and it actually begins in the rear of the E39. So you'll either have a little storage cubby or these rear cup holders. The storage cubby, just shove your whole hand in there and kind of pull up and force it out. It's just held in with clips. Rear cup holders are much more sensitive. You need to open them up like this, say a quick prayer, grab a hold of the cup holders right in the middle as firmly as possible, and pull. And it doesn't work on this car. That's how I do it in the M5, but I guess not here. Plan B is a plastic non-marring pry tool. And insert that between the vinyl and the plastic cup holders. Pry outwards. Much better. There's the cup holders. Next up, we take our vents, slide them down. No need to remove it. We just need to access these two small Phillips head screws. Both of those are going to be removed, and then we'll be able to remove the armrest. With the screws removed, we can just grab the center console armrest and pull it back like that. Put that in a dry safe location. With the armrest out of the way, we see two more exposed Phillips screws. We're going to be removing these. If your car's a manual like this, you can just grab the side of the shift boot, kind of pinch in towards the shift knob, pull up, and get that out of the way. 
If you've got an automatic, you remove the tiny little boot around the uh, gear selector and then use your fingers and get in there. It's the same cutout, same shape, but it's got little metal spring tabs around the perimeter and just pull straight up and you'll get to this position. That exposes a Phillips screw in the top left, another Phillips screw in the top right. When this is up, we can reach down in here and push out the hazard switch from the bottom. And you always end up pressing it at least once. Look in there and you'll see another, this one brass, Phillips head screw. All of those will need to be removed in addition to disconnecting the electrical supplies for the hazard switch, the center locking button. And as the center console starts to come out, there's a purple connector in there for this. One more thing to disconnect here. I'm gonna put this in sixth gear maybe, just so it's out of the way. Move this heat shielding out of the way. And you'll see a light gray connector in there. That is the electrical supply for that. To remove it, it twists as looking from the passenger side counterclockwise, about 45 degrees, then pull out of the trim. I'll try to do it on a camera here. We'll just rotate it a little bit counterclockwise and it disconnects its keyed like that. To remove the console now, you can lift up from the rear and there's actually some clips, some plastic clips right under this area that will need to be released as well. You don't have to do them now, but generally you can just take that and pull up and then the whole thing's free. No need to remove the boot. You can kind of turn it sideways and fit it through the hole. The only remaining connector now is gonna be the purple one, which snaps up there, purple on one side, yellow on the other. Pull that out of the console and disconnect it. That opens up the entire center console area and will be helpful as we're running wires down along the tunnel here. So moving forwards, there's a couple ways to do this now, but we need to remove the SCM panel or the center console switch panel. You can firstly remove the cup holders by holding the front cup holders halfway open, exposing the Phillips head screws uh, on each side. That's the only hardware that holds these cup holders in, but they are very difficult to remove. They've got a plastic housing on top that usually gets stuck behind this whole metal bezel that's in here. So what I'm actually going to do is extremely carefully um, take a screwdriver, pick, pry tool, preferably something plastic, and wedge it in here. This is not ideal, but it will work. Um, in between the HVAC panel and the bezel, start to wedge this out, and it's just held in with spring clips on each side. Alternatively, you can remove your navigation display or radio and reach in there and then just push them out from behind. But I've done this enough, I'm just gonna carefully pop out the HVAC panel, which will then give us access to reach in and poke out the SCM. Once that's pulled out of the dash, you can just snake it over here to the right, let it hang out on the wires, or go through and disconnect everything. That's up to you, but I don't think it's in the way. That gives us nice, easy access to come in here and push out the old SCM switch. The electrical connection on the back has two spring clips at each side that will need to be pressed together to remove the connector. Like that. Here is the retrofit kit wiring harness. Let's get a basic look and introduction to this thing. I don't quite understand why it's so long. Maybe we will later, but it kind of branches off from here. This is going to be at our center console switch panel, which we just removed. So we have a total of four wires up here, two fat boys and two skinny ones. And it comes down here, it branches off in two pieces. One side will go to the passenger seat, one will go to the driver. We have a ground that probably needs to ground out somewhere in the chassis, so we'll find a place for that. And then we've got three wires that will be plugging into the seat. Same deal on the left side, except we've got yellow, blue, and white versus green, white, and brown, white. Let's take a brief look at some documents here. Uh, I will make these available. I'll host them on the website and post links to these documents in the description below this video for your convenience. This is for the E39 540, which should be applicable across the E39 platform. And this is the pinout for the center console switch, which is A169, if you want to look this up in new tests. So this goes through and describes what each pin does. The ones that I have circled in red, the pins 1, 12, 13, and 22, will be the wires that we're adding. And if we look at the description, signal seat heating on, temperature signal heated seat, and then the same thing likely for the other side of the car. Then we've got this diagram, thanks to whatever forum member put this together. I'll try to credit that down below. Um, it's kind of a visual representation of the entire thing. So treat this document as two halves. 
and now is where things get a little bit more complicated. If you're retrofitting heated seats, you will absolutely be following the left side of this document from my hand and to the left. If your car is a very base car that did not come from factory with sunshades, heated seats, or park distance control, then you will likely need to follow the right side of this as well. You need to add power into the center console switch panel. My 540 came from factory with a rear sunshade, and I'm very thankful for that. I've been able to retrofit park distance control and now heated seats without having to worry about tapping into fuse number 25, which takes a 25 amp fuse, and fuse 45, which is a 7.5 amp. Then there's a power source under the right-hand passenger seat that is a 50 amp power fuse. All of these should already be in place on my car. You also need to connect pin number 21 on the center console switch to the K-Bus block, which is behind the glove box. And that's a very miserable task. I did have to make a K-Bus connection when I did the PDC retrofit for the reverse signal, um, but this should not be required today for what I am doing. This video will not cover this half of the document, but it is here for your viewing pleasure, and I'm sure someone else has made a video on this. So, now focusing on the left side, we see our two components. Driver's seat, that's connector number X279, should you want to look that up and get a complete pin out. Passenger seat is X275, those are the yellow connectors that plug into the seat. We'll see that there are a few connections we need to make. P, pin, pin number 24 is ground on the passenger seat. On the driver's seat, it's pin number 24 as well, so those will be our thick ground wires. Then we have a blue-white and a yellow-white that will go from pin 23 on the seat to pin 12 on the switch. Our yellow wires pin 25 on the seat to pin 1 on the switch. And I don't need to describe the rest, it's all right here. Let's get cooking. For ease of wiring, I'm deciding to go ahead and remove a few more items here from the console. Um, those being this bottom tray, or phone rest, and then this entire uh, bezel that fits in the dash here in addition to the cup holders. So the cup holders we discussed before, open them up halfway. Got your Phillips head screws in there. Now you can reach through this opening and press down the top black plastic piece of trim that generally gets in the way, which is this right here. So if you push that down and then and you can kind of hinge the cup holders out like that. To remove the next piece here, which is this tray, we need to firstly remove the bezel. To remove the bezel, we've got two brass Phillips head screws down at the bottom. One here, one here. Then only two more screws hold the bezel in. We've got one in the top right corner and one in the top left. With the screws out, the bezel just pulls out. Since we've left the climate control panel connected, I can't remove it. So we're just going to let it hang here. Then we've got two more screws to remove this bottom tray. And for that, we need a very small, stubby Phillips driver like this to fit in here, because they're put in from the rear. And we'll be removing these two. With the screws removed from the rear, we can disconnect the electrical connector there for the cigarette lighter or power port and lift that console tray out of the way. Now we have opened up an entire area here where we can easily run our wires to tap into the center console switch. For slightly more access, I'm going to remove this little black piece of trim here. There's just two Phillips head screws that I've removed, and then it kind of pops, pops off. Running the wiring, we're gonna be starting at the center console switch and then running each branch for the individual seats down through the console. I think it makes sense that way versus starting here and then running two branches up and then into the switch and then another one out the passenger side of the car. That seems more circuitous. So leaving plenty of wire here, these are the four wires that will attach to the switch and the branch is about 18 inches down that wire right here where it wires off. Take the driver's side cables, which are the blue and white, yellow and brown. That's gonna come down the driver's side. So first thing I went behind or underneath the center console right here. We will go underneath the console right here. We've got this metal brace. I went underneath that. We come down behind the parking brake and the little access hole here. Make sure you're not gonna interfere with any of the parking brake cables. And then we're gonna be underneath the front section of carpeting uh, at this point. So I've got the wires run to right here. At this point, I'm gonna remove a few more items so we can pull up this carpeting a little bit and find uh, one of the multiple grounding blocks that are down on the chassis. So to do that, we're gonna firstly remove the driver's uh, front kick panel. There's three plastic uh, clips that hold that into the chassis. If you just get some fingers under it here on the inside and pull straight up firmly, it will release and then just work your way down and do them one at a time. At this point, you can take the front section of carpeting and pull it up. Note they left a little slot here for the seat wires, so that's nice and easy. Pull the carpeting up like this. This will expose a whole bunch of goodies under here, thankfully pretty clean. And that's what we're looking for right there. 
Either one of those ground blocks will work. We can just disconnect that nut. I would disconnect the battery first. I don't know uh, exactly what's grounded there. The nut comes right off. At this point, we could take the spade off. I picked this inner one because it looked like it had more wire and it'd be easier to work with. And uh, we'll be able to see which positions are full. We'll just take the next one in line. And the ground that's going to go here is not the one at the end of the branch. That looks like it goes in the seat, but rather the one about two feet upstream from that. And it's the same type of connector that's there. So all we'll do is line it up with the pin, push it nice and hard, and we can see through these windows where the other pins are. So we're gonna go on the right side, kind of under this black plastic and push it all the way in with a screwdriver until it looks just like these three. The ground wire easily inserted into this spade right here. And then I took a little bit of time to just tidy up some of the wiring here. I did run it underneath. Uh, this is the duct work for the rear uh, rear seat vents, I suppose, or rear foot vents. So it's underneath that, and this cabling is rather long. So I was actually able to tie up a little bit of it here with just some, some Tessa tape, make that look as factory as possible. I did run it through this little wire management ladder clamp. You squeeze the end of those prongs together and then pull the tail out, add the wire. Uh, there's plenty of room under this too to, to tuck some wires like that nice and neat. So at this point, all we've got left are the three wires that need to be joined into the seat connector itself. And to do that, we need to slide this black plastic piece off of the yellow piece. And it looks like there's two locks on this. So on the right side, right above my fingernail, you see a little hammer looking hinge and that needs to be pressed up. There's also one on the other side, now on the left, that needs to be pressed up. When that happens, you'll be able to slide the black piece off the yellow piece to the right. Okay, that worked. So our diagram shows that we're gonna be adding the blue wire to pin 23, the yellow wire to pin 25, and these are labeled somewhere. I'll need a light. So I've made most of the proper electrical connections at, uh, at, at the driver's seat. Uh, just following the diagram we discussed earlier. Now it does not mention this ground, and I checked the continuity. The other end of this cable right here is what we grounded over there. And we already have a very large gauge brown ground wire going into pin 14. I actually don't think this is going to be necessary, but we're gonna plug things in and test shortly and see what happens. Uh, so from there, I peeled back the old Tessa wiring tape here that was half falling off already. And I figure I'll just blend everything together when I'm done and I know this works. In the meantime, I've just put a few different pieces of tape to secure this to the primary harness. Um, so I'm gonna tidy this up a little bit here, get the seat in here and uh, verify functionality. I suppose before we do that, we should talk about some uh, switching, switch wiring up here. And to get into this connector, we need to remove the black plastic piece just like we did on the seat. And it's got a lock tab right there above my thumbnail. So if we pry up that little black tab just a little bit, the black piece will slide off to the right. We're pretty much a mirror for the passenger side of the car. I ran the passenger branch right along the driver's side branch under the same three pieces. Difference is, right here at the carpet split, we go underneath the rear seat um, HVAC duct, and then we go underneath the carpeting here, and there's just enough room to kind of pull the console out, get some fingers in there, and run everything. It's a little tight getting it under this, but nothing that couldn't be done in about five minutes. Then we're underneath the carpeting here. I pulled up the little sill entry guard over here as well. Went under the rear seat foot vent, did the same thing with the ground using the ground block on the left, push that in, then back under the panel, and we're going to join the seat connector here. The green and white wire plugs in pin 25. The brown and white wire plugs in pin 23. Passenger seat wiring at the center console switch, green-white goes to pin 13, brown-white to pin 22. So that's put back together. I took some Tessa tape and made this connector look pretty and as factory as possible. And at this point, I'm gonna put the passenger seat in, give it a test to make sure all the motors and um, heating works and all of the like. And assuming it does, Got a lot of reassembly to do. Okay, that's a success. In about two minutes, this one starts getting quite toasty. The left one seemed a little slower, uh, but I turned this one on before I checked all the motors, so it may be because of that. Anyways, that's working. An important note, if your seat isn't plugged in, like my driver's side seat, even with everything wired properly, the button will not illuminate. The seat has to be plugged in for the system to realize, yep, we're sending power there. So. Now time to lift this seat back out. My back's gonna love that and reassemble. The ground pin that we grounded out earlier, I don't know why I was in a fog last night at 11 p.m. after working all day, but very clearly goes in pin 24. The other end is the chassis, it's pin 24 on both seats. I have made that adjustment. 
It's a large pin right in between the other two. Fits great. The seats go in and back together exactly as they came out. For the four Torx 50 bolts that holds the bottom of the seat in, you'll want a drop of blue Loctite on each of those bolts and then torque them down to 33 pound-feet. For the seat belt Torx 50 bolt, we will not need any Loctite, and that'll go down to 36 pounds. The seats I've elected to install are E38 7 Series Sport Contour seats. These are 18-way power seats. They're significantly more supportive and more comfortable than the original E39 Comfort seat. So we've added all of this bolstering down here at the bottom. We've added power thigh extensions, similar to the M5. We retain the center adjustable backrest cushion for maximum comfort. And of course, we still have power headrests as well. You'll notice that the back of the seat is taller. It comes up around the headrest now. And all of this just leads to a totally different experience in driving and riding in this car. It feels more luxurious, more comfortable, more supportive, more like a 7 Series. The heating option is fantastic. It's about 80 degrees right now in June in Southern California, but uh, still at night it gets fairly cool and it's nice to have that option to pop the heaters on. These seats have been recently recovered in genuine black leather that matches the texture, look, and style of the rest of the seats absolutely beautifully. The whole car smells like leather. Taking a look at the back of the seats, we see those taller backrests here. They're a little awkward looking, at least I thought at first. I've gotten used to it. It's a nice look now, I think. And these backrests, fresh leather there as well, and they actually spring shut and stay shut, which I'm very happy about. The seller also included side panels. So we've got fresh, genuine BMW black side panels for each seat. Before I installed the seat, I put the fire extinguisher in there, just like the M5, just as a little kind of backup insurance policy that you don't see unless you look for it. As always, thanks for watching. Please leave any comments and questions down below. Feel free to email me, ryan at e39source.com. We'll talk in the next e39source video. Take care.